type of our talk is propping open the document trap door. Um, we think the reason we chose that title will become evident as we go through the talk. But as Asok said, what we're really interested in is sort of rethinking the way presentational documents are described on a computer for the 21st century. I mean, by presentational documents, we're talking things at the sort of level of PDF, things that have got a very high quality uh, typeset appearance, but are used to communicate electronically. So what I'm going to do in this talk, and Dave will come in and add his bits at various intervals, given the history and the philosophy alongside this, I shall talk about what's actually changed in the marketplace in the way people consume documents and why we think it's important that we do this now. And also we'll then go into detail what are the problems with the current document formats like PDF for doing these sort of things. But with most things, the best place to start with this is at the beginning. And this story really began early in the year when I bought myself an ebook reader. I went for the Sony model, but they all seemed to be pretty much similar. And what I found was that while reading a standard novel was pretty good, the uh, appearance was very nice, you got the text, you got the images, the fonts were good, and it looked pretty good. When I loaded on my PhD thesis, which was stored as a PDF, things started to look not quite so uh, easy to use. So, my PDF was designed for A4 paper size, but obviously the display size on the ebook reader is a lot smaller than that, so the device had to resize the display to fit on there. And the default option it chose was to just shrink everything down to a much smaller size. And as you can see, it was just about legible, but it wasn't very nice to read, and you're actually having to strain and sort of fill in the gaps from what was being shown. But it got the display right. But I didn't worry. The manual for the ebook reader had said that it had the option to reflow the PDF to sort of fit it on to increase the font size so you could read it nicely. So I pressed the button to do that and was presented with this, where, yes, it had reflowed the text to fit, but all the formatting, all the presentation information had started to be lost. It had kept the right sort of fonts, but the fact that it was double line spaced was the standard for PhD thesis in the UK was lost. And you also started to see that the actual line breaking had gone slightly wrong and things didn't look anywhere as nice. It was okay to read as a performance, but it wasn't as nice as had been seen before. When I realized there was a big problem, it was when I started to look at some of the mathematics in my thesis, what had displayed fine suddenly ended up rotated on its side and completely uh, broken. So the matrix there which I typed and it was neatly typeset, and suddenly ended up rotated through 90 degrees and translated, and so it was just complete garbage. And as I went through more and more of the PDF and more documents like this, I found that while it could cope with very simple things, when it was presented with highly technical stuff, it went wrong. And what we're actually seeing here is the difference between the two common formats used on ebooks. On the one hand, we have EPUB, which is being used for the novel, the Alice in Wonderland novel, which is basically XHTML with a few extra bits to define how things appeared, all zipped up in one thing, which worked okay for novels, but obviously, as we know, HTML has limited support to typeset mathematics and things, and so it isn't so good for technical documents. On the other hand, we had the PDF display, which was very, very good at getting the typesetting absolutely right and getting a fixed performance, but it was fixed to the page size it was designed for, and any attempt to reflow it, as we saw on the last slide, just looked absolutely horrible. And so we had these two formats, one of which, which could work and reflow nicely, and another which could capture the presentation. And as I looked more at the EPUB, what I realized was even though at the uh, sort of site here, it was just about okay with the presentation, the sort of quality of the type settings it was creating, as you reflowed this and altered the font size, you started to see that the quality of the typesetting really dropped off. And here you've got this column of text on the right where there's only one or two words per line, and it's not quite as nice to read. And as you increase the font size even more, we found that things just got really, really nasty. You get one word per line on the right-hand side, and if you can just see here on the word wondering, the letter G has just disappeared off the edge of the ebook reader screen. So I realized at this point that there was a bit of a problem with the way the documents are being stored. And then, for comparison, I got hold of my old childhood copy of Alice in Wonderland and compared the layout and realized that even with the EPUB, 
the experience of reading it on the thing wasn't quite up to the same standard that you got with the hand typeset, probably hot metal in this case, copy that you get on paper. And so I started to think whether this was an actual inherent problem with the formats or whether it was something that could be just a problem with the device as a whole. And what I came up with the conclusion was that it, it is down to the current formats. They don't seem to work for devices like this. You either have formats like EPUB, which allow a good presentation um, that can be reflowed, with, well, uh, in certain circumstances, although that breaks down as the uh, constraints get too hard for it to, to handle, as we saw as we increase the font size. Or we get stuff like PDF, which has a really good presentation, providing you view it at the same size every time. And so I was discussing this with Dave, and we came to the conclusion, we came down to the question, is our current document format suitable for ebooks? We started to ask this to ourselves. And then as we thought about this a bit more, we realized that the actual scope of this question was slightly larger and was down to whether our current document formats really suitable for the way we consume documents in the 21st century. Allow me to explain a bit about what I mean by this. Um, traditionally, when people have sat down to design a document, whether it's a home user using Microsoft Word to write a letter or to produce a leaflet for their local club or something, they'll sit down and design it in the software for one particular layout. And even professional designers will do this. If they're laying out a magazine or a newspaper, they have a fixed presentation that they're producing this for. And so they'll lay it out for that. Occasionally, you do get things which are published in multiple formats. The classic example is novels that come in hardback, softback, and sometimes even other more weird-shaped versions. But because these are being produced in multiple copies, many, many thousands of copies, they're just effectively treated as single documents that just happen to have the same content in them. And so as I thought about this, I realized that these days, we don't just consume documents on one device in one fixed presentation. We may take a document and view it on an e-book reader or a mobile device, or we may view it on a range of different computer technology. And of course, we will still print it and use it on paper. And as I thought about it, you start to realize that all these devices have very different display characteristics. I mean, the laptop and the desktop computer are pretty similar, but the netbook computer often has a much truncated screen vertically, and so you get far less displayed on it than you would say on a laptop or a net. Uh, uh, desktop. In terms of the ebook reader and the mobile device, the screens are much smaller and can't hope to contain as much display as you'd find on paper or on a computer desktop. And actually, this is a thing we're all familiar with. If you've ever tried to read a multi column PDF on our computers, we find that we're always scrolling up and down the same page as we get to the bottom of one column and back up to the top, we have to scroll around. Or we see it on web pages where We've got a fixed layout encoded in HTML, and as we resize the window, it stays at that fixed size, and we end up with white space on the other side. Or the other alternative we find is that we just get lots and lots of long lines of text, which are not very easy to read as we see them on the screen. Excuse me. So as we considered all this, Dave and I realized that if we're going to support modern usage of documents, this idea that they can be viewed on multiple devices at multiple sizes, then we really must rethink how we describe them on the computer so that the document formats take into account this fact that they're going to be viewed on different size devices. But we then realized that we needed to step back and think about what it is people do with documents. What do people want from a document and just what actually a document is before we started to think about how we designed the new format. So we stepped back and started to think about the document's purpose. The first thing we realized was a document was an information carrier. It was designed to carry information to the person reading it. And this could be in the form of a novel for entertainment, or it could be a technical document that you're reading to get some information out of. And in this case, it's important that we realize that it doesn't just contain text, we may find images, equations, tables, diagrams, etc., in there. And possibly we realize this in the future with the advent of cheap camcorders and so on and people producing lots and lots of material that you find on YouTube, that people may want to produce documents that also merge in video and audio clips as well. So as we started thinking about a docu new document format, we realized that we'd have to cope with more than just text being flowed onto the page. 
We then started to think about how people use documents, and we first realized that the most important thing is that people are going to read or consume them. And this means that they must have a presentation. They must have something that displays them. It's not just good enough to have the text encoded for the computer to deal with. We must be able to display it for the human to cope with. And the other thing to remember here is that the design of this is really important. The way it is designed really has an effect on how the human sort of feels about the information contained. If something is very poorly de designed, they often don't feel confident with the material, whereas if you've got a very nice, clear layout, then they often put a lot more confidence in the material of what it's saying. So we realized that the, the way the layout, the design of the document was absolutely vital, important, and we needed to be able to encode that as well. Of course, the other problem is that we need to be able to change that design sympathetically depending on what device we're viewing it on. So if we're viewing it on a, a desktop computer, we've got a lot of resources, big screen real estate, and we can generally fit quite a lot in. But if we're viewing it on an e-book reader, we've got far smaller space, and perhaps we'd have to switch from two column to a single column layout and such like. But we'd also have to make sure that images were positioned like we saw with the Alice in Wonderland example, so that we didn't get strange text layout happening around it. The other thing we realized about documents is that people like to be able to repurpose these things. They like to be able to take content from them and use them in new documents. Now, this could be like we all did as kids with scrapbooks. We just cut out a piece of information from a newspaper and stick it into a scrapbook just to keep it. Or it may be that we want to use this content to drive another computer process. So we may have an equation in a text, in a paper that we're reading, and we may want to feed it in something to plot that graph for us. And so we realized that we needed some form of structure as well as a presentation in these sort of new document formats to support this. So we had some sort of idea of what the content actually was so that the computer could process it as well as a human could sit and read it. So to recap, documents would be information carriers, but that information wouldn't just be text. Anything we did needed to have strong presentation. We needed to be able to encode the presentation of the document with it so that we could reuse this every time and view it and understand it with a human. But we also needed to encode some sort of structure so that it was repurposable for the computer to use it, both in terms of being able to reflow it to fit onto a new display, but also in terms of being able to use it to drive a new process. And it's this repurposability that we really think is the key feature that we're going to have to consider as we consider to develop these new document formats. The fact that we'll need to be able to repurpose them to new display shapes or to repurpose them to new computer processes, we've got to keep that in mind when we design these new documents. The other thing we realized is speed. These devices have quite low power processors compared to, say, our desktop or laptop computers. It's an ARM chip, probably around a few hundred megahertz. But they also have higher resolution displays than computer screens have typically been. So as while they're having to generate more information on the screen, they've also got less computer processing time to deal with it. And what we actually find is that the more complicated the presentation is, the more computation the computer has to do, the less page turns per battery charge we're able to get. And with a device like an e-book reader or e even a mobile phone, we really want to maximize this page ch turns per charge. Um, just to give you an example before I hand over to Dave to continue of how this is even a problem on desktop computers. I have a PDF here that I created for one of the other people at the University of Nottingham. And what I find is that even on my 2.8 gigahertz laptop, you can still see it visibly redisplay on screen as I change to it. And so as you move around and zoom in and out, I can just do that, you can see it displaying on screen. The document is so complicated that even on a 2.8 gigahertz laptop, you can still visibly see it refresh. And in terms of an e-book reader, that is something you want to minimize. You want to try and Mimic the format, yes. Sorry, uh, not to interrupt, but the, the metric of maximizing page turns per, char per charge is a very specific metric to would you like to use a key in where as long as yeah. you're not turning the page. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes. Is that really the right metric? To well, I mean, even on, uh, say, a mobile phone or a laptop, the more computation has to be done to draw it, the more battery drain you'll get on your battery. So we think 
that it's it's important. And the, the places where we read documents, I mean, on the plane over, I was reading documents, you really do want to extend the battery life if you want batteries. Obviously, on a desktop, it's not important, but we feel that these documents aren't just going to be viewed. And so what we're thinking of doing is making sure that the way we describe the document is amenable for these sort of processes, rather than just saying, we've got lots and lots of computer power, so we can do this in a way that uses it. But we're going to try and take into account that we've got small devices with low power as well as high power devices. Yeah, I think render complexity is, is certainly valid. Yeah. Page terms yeah, I mean, that's probably the wrong way to describe it, but that's where it came from as we were considering it. So, Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Dave, who is going to uh, talk through the sort of history of where current document formats have come from, and we'll perhaps give away why the title we chose and what we chose. Should we go there? Hello, everybody. Again, can I echo Steve's thanks for inviting us? It's uh, very, very good to be here. I'm David Brailsford. I think I've been called here for a little bit of a historical retrospective. Um, you will have gathered from what Steve has said, we're not really coming here with any answers, nor with any implementations of anything, because this avenue of research we've, we're passionately keen about going down has really only just started. And so, you know, we're looking for ideas and inspiration from anybody as to exactly what kind of compromises we need to make in trying to get this repurposability and reflowability and so on. And it struck me that if we looked at the two big success stories that are highly contrasting in their approach to digital documents, namely XHTML and PDF, we might learn something about how to do it and, in a sense, how not to do it as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think we all know this, really. Um, 1984, for me, was one of the most amazing years of my life. I think every computer scientist goes through certain years when they think the world changed. Nothing would ever be the same again. And for me, the, the Macintosh, the laser printer, PostScript, it just blew my mind, and it made me quite determined I wanted to be in document engineering for the rest of my career. It was quite incredible. Um, and, of course, as we all know, what it gave you was the ability to have really high-quality typeset documents. And, yes, PostScript appeared on things like Linotronic 750s and all that, very high-quality things. But the real beauty of it was that it came out on 300 DPI devices, the Apple Laser Writer, later 600 DPI. So, you know, you could proof on your laser printer, you could commit to your higher-quality device then if you wanted to, and so on. However, I think the frustrating thing just after, in the few years just after 1984, was that many of us wanted the ability on the uh, increasingly good workstation screens to preview what we were going to get without even having to commit to print on a laser printer even. And again, I'm sure lots of you know that for many technical reasons of fairly slow chips in those days, shortage of memory, and also for some political reasons as well, display postscript, as it was called, never ever really caught on or took off. But in the end, uh, fairly shortly after that, Adobe did do it right, as it were. They developed a thing originally called Carousel, which promptly had to be dropped like a hot potato when a certain Kodak threatened to sue them if they didn't stop using the name. And, uh, of course, that became Acrobat and its underlying uh, format, PDF, well known to all of us. What it essentially gives you, of course, is nothing more or less than a sort of portable print master for arbitrarily complex typeset material. It is, as we know, solidly page-based. It is very hard to reflow and repurpose as you've seen with Steve's PhD thesis, that uh, matrix, no way should it have been reflowed like that, and yet it bravely tried to do so. Amazingly, and only, of course, a few years later, one got the complete contrast in an approach to document engineering, portable documents, and so on. The experimental hypertext systems, which were developed actually in the 1980s, um, finally made it into public and popular awareness via the World Wide Web. And of course, hypertext purists in those days absolutely hated it, but it's gone on to conquer the world in many ways. And as I think Steve has already indicated, the problem there is it's HTML is a very weird hybrid of a little bit of structure and a little bit of default rendering. 
And of course, that little bit of default rendering tends to vary somewhat alarmingly from various browser manufacturers. And the idea is that if you want a better looking rendering, then you layer CSS on top of it afterwards, almost as an afterthought. It's not at all page based, as we know, it's more like a an endless scroll. So I think one of the things that uh, occurs to us in thinking about, if you like, the structure appearance compromise in any new approach to digital documents is this. HTML does a little bit of structure and a bit of default appearance and complex appearance is almost lay, uh, layered on as an afterthought. PDF is exactly the opposite way around. Your detailed appearance is this incredible mixture of what you think of as your data intermixed very intimately with rendering operators. And if you want any structure, then Adobe does enable you to create a so-called structured PDF, but it's the structure that's the afterthought. So navigating between these two extremes, which is the correct way forward? How does one sensibly take a little bit of both if that's what you want to do? So yeah, as we know, uh, page-like effects are really substituted by exotic transitions of various sorts or simple hyperlinks and so on. The other thing which I know Steve will be showing you later on is that um, many of our colleagues particularly say, oh, you know, if, good thing about XHTML, it's all in XML and anything you put in XML instantly becomes easy and clean and wonderful, to which we often reply, oh, no, it doesn't. Just because it's in XML meta notation doesn't say a thing about whether it's detailed, yucky, and so on. And certainly uh, Steve's got one or two examples to show as if you didn't know already, that uh, XML-based notation can get just as messy and just as low level as the innards of PDF do. And the other common factor, I guess, now is that XHTML and PDF are both co-generated very much from front ends. There's, I suppose, a few hardcore cells out there that still hand code their web pages, but they're uh, a dying breed. I thought I'd go through this diagram with you. Um, I'm often told by my grad students that when I go to the document engineering uh, nirvana in the sky, this is the one I'll take with me. I used it 10 years ago, and I've hardly had to change a thing. It was used at a meeting in the UK of newspaper publishers, basically saying to them, uh, yeah, remember this is late 90s, they're all familiar with dumping their postscript that produced the newspapers into PDF and then only later on finding that repurposing that for the web is well nigh impossible. Their rips that print the newspapers have done all sorts of things about the rendering order not being remotely related to the reading order. So repurposing that material can be absolutely horrendously difficult. But at the same time, the newspapers had come under a huge amount of pressure that they must start doing websites to back up the newspaper content. So I drew this diagram, and I have no shares in Adobe. I've just put InDesign up at the top as something that can generate a wide variety of outputs. And I pointed out you can come down the left-hand arm of web publishing driven by SGML, XML type um, meta syntax technology. You layer on your CSS, make it look reasonably nice. Or on the other hand, you come down the right hand arm and you go for the classic print solution for your newspaper. And I said at the time to the audience, I said, you know, I bet you those two teams that do that hardly ever talk to each other. And somebody stuck up their hand and said, it's far worse than that. They won't even go to the same pub. That's really serious, you know. So. The point I'd like to make here, because it does bear on that middle ground where all those heavy arc arrows are, is the following. If you look at going from left to right, from structure to appearance, things are not too bad. Things like web capture of Adobe's, of course, visits a web page, translates it into PDF. And also, you might say, the Apple web browser, which goes off, picks up web pages, and is solidly PDF-based, as it were, inside. Going that way is not too bad. What I want to ask somebody here, or if somebody can point me at somebody here who would know, you lot really face the difficulties the other way at a very public level because you get your Google hits, and if it lands on a PDF, it basically says viewers HTML for those people who still haven't got Acrobat Reader. Now, you do a reasonable job. It's a really tough gig. 
going the other way from appearance to structure is not at all easy. And I suppose one of my questions is that just a few, but not very many, PDFs out there on the web do have the Adobe structuring tags inside them. Again, as many of you will know, that's not really for any ultra abstract document structure purposes. It's basically to establish a reading order so that those things, if you follow the tags, so to speak, become easier to read aloud. <coughs> but if those tags are there, does it make it any easier to go back and view as HTML? Logically, it ought to, but I sometimes wonder whether they really are of any use much at all. OK. So to summarize then, I think what we're saying is somehow our new format has got to be good enough to produce a nice looking appearance, but has got to go back a little up the abstraction chain. Because, yeah, I'm saying there, look, InDesign can produce, as it were, an XMLized version of the uh, document that you input to it. It can export as HTML, it can export as PDF. But what is really infuriating for this ebook work is that you may only want to do a small amount of reflow, but you don't want to have to revisit the authoring application that designed it in the first place. You want to go a little bit backwards to the left to gain some clues about these objects. You know, is it a matrix? Is it a table? Is it a photograph? And therefore, to have a few simple rules it seems to me, about what you can do and what you can't do with those objects. I'm not saying it'll be perfect, but every little bit of hinting helps. So there we go then. Repurposing a document requires us to understand the content of the document, whether it be for extraction or reflow, and that is very, very tricky with current formats. Back to you, Steve. I hope the uh, reason for the title is because you're becoming obvious, because as we convert the documents more and more from the structural representation where we can do things like repurposing and reflow to sort of appearance or presentation based thing, it's like the document falls through a trap door and you lose enough information that trying to get back out from that point is very, very difficult. And so the, the reason for the title is that what we're effectively trying to do, as Dave said, is prop open that trap door so that we can repurpose the document and reflow it to hit new things. Now, as Dave said, it's very, very tricky in things to do that. So what I want to do now is take a look at some of the formats and see what are the weaknesses and what are the strengths that are causing it to be difficult. Um, yeah, so I'll start with XHTML. I mean, obviously, reflow is easy in XHTML. Every web browser on the planet probably manages it to some extent or another. Uh, and the reason this works is because XHTML, as you all know, describes a document in terms of text-based blocks. We have paragraphs, we have divs, and the text is just then flown into a shape to fit it. The formatting is applied at display time, so when we display the document, when we view it in our web browser, it's run through an algorithm to display that on screen. Generally, web browsers use pretty simple algorithms because the, um, the more complicated ones that get nicer, tighter layout are much more computationally extensive, uh, expensive. If we consider the NUTH plus algorithm that's used in LaTeX, if you could imagine that you'd have to wait every time you read a web page for LaTeX to sit and typeset your document for you before you could actually view what it was you wanted to see on screen, I don't think the web would have taken off anywhere near as much as it has now. But what we find, even though XHTML is good at reflow, is that when we want to do complicated layout, things get more nasty. We have CSS floats, which effectively end up positioning things roughly at absolute positions on the screen. Or if you were to do really complicated layout, again taking an example from Alice in Wonderland, where we've got the mouse's tail, which is sort of flowed into the shape of a mouse's tail and the font's getting smaller and smaller. If we actually look at the XHTML from the EPUB document that created this, what we actually see is that we have a series of spans containing already pre-line broken words with a different font size applied to them, and another series of spans which are actually providing an offset from the left-hand side of the page to position them into that wavy shape. And what we find is that as we get more and more complicated layout, we tend to become more and more down to specifics in the XHTML. PDF really does take this to the nth degree, and what PDF is interested in is that hard-coded appearance, and everything in a PDF describes that. 
For those that are not familiar, a PDF is constructed from a set of what are called COS objects. These are built up into various structures to represent different things within the document. So as Dave said, there's a structure tree in some PDFs, but there's also a pages tree which defines all the pages on the things. Each page is represented by an object, and this will have links to other objects which represent the resources it might use, fonts, images, etc., and also a description of the page content. Now, this page content description is stream-based. It's a series of ASCII characters that are processed by the PDF interpreter to display things on screen. Unlike, perhaps, PostScript, which some of you may be familiar, which was a full imperative programming language, PDF is completely declarative. The operators within the PDF content stream just describe, image this piece of text here, draw a line from here to here, place this bitmap image at this position. There's no sort of computation done there. It's completely declarative in what's appearing on the page. And this is why PDF was designed to be much faster in the early 90s with the computers there than PostScript was to display on screen. So the operators that appear on script that are in that can be described in two groups. There's the content operators, which describe what appears in the document. These fall into things like paths that are, can be filled or stroked, text, which can be applied in very different fonts and so on, bitmap images, and a few other things. And alongside them, there are operators which set the context which these content is drawing. So you can set the fill color, the line width, the font size, and so on. And once these are set, they persist until they're changed or the end of the document or page is reached. So if we take a look at the output from a typical PDF, this is the content stream. And you see that you get operators that say image the T at this position, followed by an O at another position, then it images the letters I and N together, a V and an ENT. And one of the things you see is that PDF isn't even concerned with spaces between words. As far as it's concerned, there's no need to encode them because if you're imaging things at an absolute position, then they'll appear at that point anyway. And you find that these PDF streams go on and on, and eventually when viewed, they image the page that we're interested in. As you see up here on the top line, we get the two invent programs that we started to look at in the content stream. So the PDF content stream is purely designed to image the things on the screen. And one of the big problems with PDF is that the content stream basically works on the principle that the end result just defines the means that you get with it. And so as it's only concerned with the final appearance, the way the content is imaged is immaterial as far as the PDF interpreter is, con is concerned. As long as you get the final appearance, it's happy. And then what you find is that in some PDFs, you don't get the text imaged in reading order. So not only is it broken up into single characters or small words, you sometimes find that they aren't imaged in the same order at all on the page that you'd expect. And I've got an example of this that I'll show you in a minute. You also find this being done for specific reasons, and that some graphical effects that type designers use, you often find require things to be imaged out of order. As an example of that, I've uh, written a small program which allows me to stop the execution of the PDF interpreter here. So on this, I've got two, example, two copies of the same PDF document, but they image the document in different ways. And I've also got a slider at the right that allows me to control how much of the document is imaged. And what we see is we alter the amount of the documents imaged is the two ways they build up the document. So this one on the left is using what typographers would call baseline sort, or more commonly is hopping the gutter. And so as it builds up, it'll image the text on the left, followed by the text on the right, whereas the one on the right is using a much more sensible approach and is imaging the text in the way we would read it. So it's going down the column on the left and down the column on the right. And the problem this causes is if we want to do anything with a PDF in terms of reflow, we can't just apply some sort of process to get the text out, we have to sort of reorder it as, it as it appears in the content stream into the order that we'd expect to read it so they can reflow it as we'd expect. Otherwise, we'd end up, as we often see sometimes with cheaper PDF viewers, that you cut and paste some text out of it and it all ends up jumbled up on screen when you repaste it in. The other problem with the PDF, if we're trying extracting content for repurposing or reflow, is that 
the operator, some of the operators set the context, the line width, the font color, and so on, as I said. And these persist until the end of the document or until something else changes. And the problem with this is that we can find that these operators right at the beginning of the stream, which are having an effect on things that appear at the end of the document. And if we're not careful and we just go and pull the content out from the end without considering with what's gone before, we find that what we end up with displaying on screen is completely different to what we expected to pull out. And we can actually draw the analogy here to a computer program. If we consider the PDF content stream to be a computer program, then what we're actually trying to do is extract one procedure from the program for reuse elsewhere. And if we're to do that effectively, we need to consider how that procedure is affected by the rest of the program. It may rely on other procedures or functions in the document or on the setting of global variables by other parts of the program. And so we can't just extract a piece of a program and use it elsewhere without considering the whole of the rest of the program. And it's exactly the same with the PDF. If we want to extract some content from it, then we have to consider the whole of what the PDF page was doing to get to image the whole page and sort of constrain it ourselves and really understand what's going on. So we feel it's quite clear that the current formats aren't really suitable for getting a high quality of presentation that we can reflow and repurpose as we'd want. They either don't really allow high quality layout with HTML, we have to sort of fake it by using tables, spans, CSS floats and things. Or we have things like PDF which do allow a really high quality of layout but require significant um, processing to do any repurposing and even then the end result is something that isn't as effective as we'd like. But can they actually be tweaked? Do we have to go off and develop a completely new format or can we make some tweaks to the existing formats to make them suitable? And what we'd like to do now is just talk about some of the work we've done in the past few years at Nottingham to attempt to do this. So the first was actually the topic of my PhD a few years back, which we called COGS, which we'll look at first. And then Dave will come up and look at some work we also did at marrying a structural representation of the document with a presentational representation as well and link, forming hard links between the two. So the component object graphic or COGS was basically an attempt to extend the metaphor of the document as a computer program. And we said it's hard to pull code out of a PDF in the same way it's hard to pull code out of a program. But we've developed tools when we write software to make this easier. So we use things like object-oriented programs where we write things in terms of objects which are designed to be pulled out and reused elsewhere. And so we said, what if documents were object-oriented? And so we implemented this on top of PDF. We found ways that we could use structures that no one was using inside PDF to create sort of object-oriented blocks of content, which we could then image on the page. So we redefined the page. So instead of being a complete monolithic block of content operators that draw things, we said that the page is now as a series of objects, or cogs as we called them, that are Im imaged on the page at specific points. And we also said, and this was the crucial thing, that each cog would be completely self-contained. What we meant by this is that the cogs would assume nothing about the content state or the graphic state of the page. So if the cog wanted something to be read and in Times Roman, it would explicitly set that this thing was to be imaged in red Times Roman, rather than saying, oh, the last thing I did was in red Times Roman, I don't need to change it. So it explicitly set up the state that it needed. It would also, again, this was just like PDF, link to the resources. And the thing we found as we did this was that we actually had to link to the resource that was used to create this piece of content because there are subtle variations in the widths of the glyphs in fonts, for example, which cause if you didn't link to the exact instance that was used to create it, then you found the typesetting all went horribly, nastily wrong. The other thing we did was to say, well, these cogs should be good citizens. If they make changes to the content, they'd also undo those changes or make sure that they didn't affect anything after that so that you could then remove them and add them into the document as we went. As I said, we implemented all this on top of PDF, and we did this in a way that didn't break compatibility with any, uh, with any PDF viewer. So all my COG PDF documents are completely valid PDFs. However, if we were to load them into a tool which understood COG PDF, which is generally Acrobat with a few plugins I wrote on top of it, although a couple of other people have implemented parts of the specification, 
then we can manipulate the document in various ways. We can remove content from the page very easily, add extra content, reposition it on the page, even create new documents by dragging content from one document into another. And we also have programmatic ways of doing that. So this allowed us to provide a way where we could easily extract content for reuse in other documents and to allow new documents to be formed. But it didn't really help with reflow. We'd solved all the containment issues, but all we'd done in terms of reflow was to sort of, sort of reduce the problem down to a smaller size. We still had all the same sort of yuckiness inside the cog that you find in a PDF page. It was just that it now applied to a much smaller part of the document. And so we had some hope of doing that, but not much. I'm going to hand over to Dave now, who will close by talking the work we did merging PDF and Thanks, Steve. I think it's uh, down to me to say a few more things, and I think to wind up the, uh, the whole talk as well. What hasn't been said explicitly um, yet, but I think is worth while interjecting something about it, is to say, if we come at this problem top down in the great new future, <coughs> one of the things that surely is going to have to happen, and I don't see many signs of it at the moment in things shall we say, like in design, is rather than saying you can start with InDesign and go to XHTML, you can go straight through to PDF, you can do other output formats with it, they all tend to be one-way processes with these kind of implicit trap doors in. You can't easily get back to infer what the starting uh, InDesign script was. But also, I don't see much sign of the thing saying, ah, so you are a document author, and of course, you will want to create a multipurposable document. You'll want to do it not only for a hard copy novel, but you want to create the ebook as well. So help me. Come on, give me some hints. Tell me, when you start putting these tables in, what would you like me to do with them? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm inferring that what you're doing here is going to be of type table, and that you're not just abusing tabular facilities, are you, to to gain, you know, graphically nice content, but it's not really of type table. All those sort of things do seem to me to be very, very important indeed. That we start trying, first of all, to design in repurposability, but also to accept the inevitable fact that people will absolutely swear blind. It's going to end up on US letter and never on anything else, and then somebody will sling it on to an e-book reader for which it has not been designed, and we still want to do a better job than is currently being done. And that is the real challenge. And perhaps the biggest challenge developing on from that is not coming top down and going bottom up. People will want to, re uh, to how should we say, rescue legacy PDFs from the web, which is what you guys do all the time. And it will be lovely to be able, if we can afford the time to infer the structure a bit better, to do a better job than just slamming it into HTML and closing your eyes and sort of hope it works. But that inference of structure is not easy to do, and yet it does seem to me that to get old material better than it is at the moment it is an important thing to work on. Well, my group actually back in uh, the mid-1990s, I think, I think we were the first to publish on this. I guess there may have been other groups in the world working on it at the time. Uh, in about 1995, we started looking at inferring document layouts and document structures and document objects bottom up, not starting as the uh, scanner manufacturers would do with a bitmap, but just starting with an unstructured PDF. You know, it's come from somewhere. Can you tell me what it is? Is it a newspaper? Is it a magazine? Is it an academic article? So that was the sort of structure of recognition we tried to do, roughly that kind of granularity, that kind of level. And then it really did hit us, of course, for the first time that rendering order not being the same as reading order is a huge, huge problem. You start having to do X, Y sorts on all your text runs and so on and so forth. And, of course, these techniques were used and are now very widely used in OCR. They are, of course, used in Adobe's own Acrobat Capture, where they use OCR to acquire the text and then lay that text, as it were, invisibly behind the bitmap, and then, with their Capture plugin, come up with the apparent miracle of searchable bitmap text. And 
you can make bitmap PDFs more accessible that way as well. So Stasis was our product where we started working on this and made us realize the real importance of document structure inference. The other thing we've done, which again I think highlighted to us some of the problems we face, but in some senses was a step on the way. Uh, from about 2001 to 2006, I had a couple of my grad students uh, working on the problem of something like this. Suppose you've got an unstructured read-only PDF and you want to make it more accessible. You are not allowed to add structure into it. It's on a CD or some copyright restriction say you may not mess with it at all. We tried a lot of work and it was really very useful in saying, well, we could kind of externalize, if you like, the structure as I believe what the XML people call standoff markup. You could have your original dot book, as it were, source, um, and what you assert is your corresponding PDF text, and then build a kind of shadow tree of pointers, saying this paragraph in dot book notation really does, in byte pointer terms, start there in the PDF and end there in the PDF. And you can imagine it was a huge relief to us doing that if ever we got one of Steve's COG PDFs because then it's very clear you point at the right cog. You are not pointing at bits and pieces of PDF rendered in funny orders, which logically belong to the same thing. But of course, unfortunately, not many people create cog PDFs. So we were able, um, you know, basically to say that piece of typeset music notation here corresponds to the abstract uh, music request, as it were, in your original source document. So yeah you could point from something like the DocBook original into the PDF. It works fine up to a point. The problem I would say is basically this. You've got your abstractly structured document here. You've got your detailed PDF here. You build links via what we call landmark pointers from one to the other. It's handy to have that assertion of equivalence, but the problem is those arcs are not decorated in any way with how you did it. What was the document processing that went on between there and there? And I think what we're saying is that exactly those links between your starting point and your finishing point ideally should be decorated with just enough hints, for want of a better word, as to how you might First of all, what type of object is it we're talking about, and what are the reflowability options available for that thing? So that is really, in my view, what we need to be looking at in our new format, carrying over in the mapping at least some of the rendering reflow decisions, and at the authoring end, trying to extract that out of the author without hacking them off and, you know, them saying, oh, I'm trying to get on with designing my book. Honest, it will never appear on a BE book and just... I don't want to get into a situation of the bouncing paperclip, you know, where it comes up to you and says, hey, I think you might be going to an e-book with this thing. Have you ever thought about what might happen? But yet, it would be wonderful if we could extract that information up front from the authors. Okay, so just a final slide then. Where to next? Document representation, and what we're saying is, what should this representation be? We don't want it to get too heavyweight, and yet we want it to enable us to do a better job than we currently do on the exact sort of examples that Steve has uh, based. Should it be component-based? We see some real advantages in going that way, in rejigging your components like sliding blocks, so to speak, on the page. Where does the heavy lifting work, uh, happen? In some sense, um, the more you just put hints on things, the more you're relying on your actual rendering engine still to do uh, something about that. And as we found, what you don't want is to flatten your battery in about two seconds flat, trying to implement some fabulous reflow algorithm which makes it look beautiful but is very computationally expensive. Another possibility would be to have a sort of interpretation scenario of the sort I'm saying, you consult your hints dynamically on the fly, but maybe being able to compile some key documents, if it's worthwhile doing it, down into a more compiled code form, closer to, shall we say, the graphic primitives on the Apple, is another thing we're looking at. Multimedia, we haven't said a word about it, but we know it's not going to go away. Um, it gives us a headache even just thinking about text on ebooks. But yeah, we know multimedia has got to be coped with. And as I've tried to indicate, I think, this business of backwards compatibility, you've, it's no use 
wishing that XHTML and PDF would be suddenly replaced by some wonderful new intermediate that combines the best of both. People will want to put their own documents and give them this new reflow, repurposable capability if we can, but we've got to recognize enough structures in them to be able to do that. Is that it? Okay, I think we'll call a halt there. Thank you very much and invite questions if that's what one does in Google. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.